Okay guys, so I'm about to go on to take the TMC. Super nervous. Uh, yeah, wish me luck. You guys, I am officially a certified respiratory therapist and I can now schedule for my CSE. Oh my God, you guys, that was ridiculous. I thought I was going to fail the stupid thing, but I only missed like nine questions. Can you freaking believe that? I only missed like nine questions. What is that? That's absurd. Okay, so basically, <laughs> oh my God, I'm so happy right now. Okay, so basically that's it. I've passed it and once I calm down a little bit, I will give you guys more details of what I've been doing to study, to try to achieve the score that I got and then I will kind of go over all my CSE stuff with you guys also. All right, sorry, <laughs> I'll talk to you guys in a second. Okay, you guys, so, um, yeah, I passed my TMC, so I wanted to share what I've kind of been doing, studying, and then a couple of little things that I think will hopefully take a little bit of the stress off of you. So first things first, the TMC consists of 160 questions. 20 of the questions are not graded, they're being used as test questions or practice questions to see if they want to be turned into graded questions later in the future. So you are getting scored off of 140 questions. So you need 88 correct answers. Keep in mind this is not a percentage, it's a number of questions. So you need 88 out of 140 correct to be considered a certified respiratory therapist. And to be eligible to sit for your clinical simulation exams, you need, uh, you need 94 questions correct. Again, not 94%, this is not a percentage, it's 94 correct out of 140 scored questions. Uh, how was the test? Of course, I was nervous, um, so nervous, I couldn't concentrate the day of. I had decided, you know, to take a day off kind of the night before my exam. My exam was in the afternoon at about 3.30 or so. I could not focus at all the night before, which is fine, because sometimes I think it's better to take a break, especially when you've been studying so hard for so long. It gives your brain a minute to kind of readjust and reset itself. I've binged on some TV shows I haven't been able to watch while I've been in the program and just really relaxed. I did um, the morning of the exam review a couple of little things just very quickly to kind of keep them fresh in my mind, a couple of things that I know that I was a little bit iffy on or that occasionally I would get wrong on practice exams, but I didn't do anything intensive. I literally already had notes pre-written from before and just reviewed those notes again maybe for an hour because again my exam was at 3.30 and I did that the morning of. And then I used the rest of the day to kind of try to relax, decompress, that's all I did the day of. And like I said the day before, I just hung out and relaxed. So what did I do <laughs> though? Because I ended up scoring much better than I thought. But honestly, the score is not that important because as long as you get, you know, that 94 mark to be able to sit for your clinical simulation exam, it doesn't really matter what you get after that. You're not going to get a cookie or, you know, brownie points or anything of the sort. You're all getting the same certification and registration. So, you know, that's not a big deal. My goal, I was aiming to do the best I could do and anything over 94 and I ended up surprising myself and doing much better than that. So I know I've been talking to you guys about this book forever, Persings. That is the thing that I've been using the longest. Since probably third semester when I got my Persings book, um, I was using that just to review in general different concepts when we would go over them or if I needed a really fast review on something that pertained to something new we were learning, I would use Persings to kind of quickly review that information. And that's where I got a lot of the tips and tricks for, for equations as well. Um, and then I also this semester did a workshop for Persing. If you guys want to check that out, I did a video on that a few weeks ago. I'll link that somewhere in the description box. And same thing here, all of the items I talk about that I used, I will link them 
I was not sponsored, unfortunately, by any of these, so all of them I had to pay for, but it's worth it and I want to share these things with you guys and what worked for me. Again, all of the same things might not work for you guys because I know that there are people that preferred other systems and other books more than I did. So again, I would really recommend taking one of the workshops if you can, whether that's Persing, Lindsay Jones, Kettering, whichever one is most accessible to you and whichever one you feel aligns with your learning style. I feel like that made a huge difference just after doing that workshop. I was doing okay before on all of the practice exams, but after I felt like the test taking strategies for that particular exam were much more clear once I had an understanding of exactly what they were looking for. And then I also used something that you get for free along with your student membership from the AARC. They have a section called the AARC University where you can actually find a lot of material to study in general, but just recently they put out an exam prep course, which is actually really amazing. It's got a lot of really well-known people in the AARC that are actually teaching in these videos, along with PowerPoints you can download, print, and use wherever you want. It was really educational and it was just a really good supplement and it was nice to have something that was, you know, kind of free for me. I believe this did recently change. When I signed up for the respiratory therapy program, we were given two years free of the ARC membership where it was, you know, in our tuition, so we got it automatically. I don't believe that is happening anymore, but I do know that your student membership is about $25 per year. So you can spend $25 to get your student membership for the AARC and get access to their forums that are strictly for students, to educational material, educational videos, as well as the new exam prep course that they have available, $25 for the whole year. So it's just a good way to network and then also that prep course in general is amazing and all the PowerPoints that go along with it. So definitely recommend. And then something else I was using right before was tutorial systems and that is $20 a month and it's a full review course um, no videos though just text with different highlight colors where they have noted what seems to appear more often or what is more heavily focused on that one was really good the practice tests were actually quite difficult on that one I was still doing fine on them but you generally want your practice test to be a little bit more difficult than the actual exam because then once you get in the exam and you start going through those questions, you're kind of like, oh, okay, this isn't that bad, I've got this. <laughs> it's a good relieving feeling, especially when you walk in so anxious because you know there's so much writing on this one exam. I started reviewing probably about two semesters ago and that was in my third semester. My program for the associates has five semesters. As we were learning new material, I would try to review material that pertained to it that was previous. So for example, before we started hemodynamics, I was reviewing just the cardiopulmonary circulation in general to try to get a grasp on that before going into my new class because that makes a big difference. Because for example, my cardiac and pulmonary a &P, that was all the way in my first semester and my hemodynamic class was in my fifth semester. So that's a big gap. And if you wait that long to review information, it takes a toll, you know, you can't be expected to remember every tiny little detail for two years and then just jump right into something. It, it, at least my brain doesn't work like that. I have to review a lot and review constantly. And I know that that is not easy to do. I've talked before about that being a struggle for myself personally and kind of seeing the differences in my exams that I was taking when I was reviewing for the boards at the same time as learning new material, but it is something you have to do and you have to really prioritize your time to make sure you are putting in that extra effort to be prepared once you do graduate. So how I started once I got close to finishing the uh, program and I knew that my boards were coming up shortly because I wanted to try to take them as soon as possible. I waited about six days because I had family in town, we had our pinning ceremony, and you know, I, I lost probably three days of that just from family and graduating and things in between. Once I did start studying, maybe about, you know, really buckling down about a month or two before I finished. I started out by taking notes from my Persing book 
And the only notes I took though were things that I didn't understand or things that I couldn't immediately answer. Now, in the beginning, it's a lot. <laughs> I won't lie, it's a lot. There's some pages you can skip completely and then other pages it feels like you're just rewriting the whole page. And that's okay, it starts out like that for sure. So don't let that overwhelm you. And then as I would go back and re-review those notes, I would start removing things that I was more comfortable with or things that I could now answer without having to look up the answer or really having to, you know, think hard about it. And it was the same thing. If I noticed there was one area that I was struggling in more than others, so for example, um, PFTs. And I think that's an area that a lot of people get nervous about because we learn about it, but not everybody is lucky enough to have a full rotation in a PFT lab. So a lot of people do get very anxious about, you know, reading them and understanding what means what. So I spent a little more time there, maybe an extra hour just focusing on that. And then I would go back and start re-reviewing everything again. Because if you spend three days on one subject, you're losing a lot of time on that one subject when you need to be well-rounded overall. And the reason I say that is because there are, you know, 160 questions, 140 are graded, you're not going to have 60 questions on PFTs. That would be absurd. Um, you, you know, you're probably going to have a couple, but that's not going to be the majority of your test, especially considering that there is a whole nother credential you can get for PFTs. So you're going to probably see a few on there, but it's not going to be the majority of your test. It's really not going to be the major focus. As you keep going through this document you've created, you can start removing areas that you feel more comfortable with. I did actually look at a lot of the exam prep courses and material. You know, I looked at Kettering, I looked at Lindsay Jones, I looked at Persing, again, um, tutorial systems in the AARC website. I was not personally a huge fan of Kettering and Lindsay Jones. I felt like they were really overwhelming, but I know a lot of people really like them. I found it too overwhelming. I found that it was just too much information and a lot of things that I didn't want to focus on personally. That's why I decided to stick with uh, Persing and primarily, you know, AARC and the tutorial systems. That's just what worked better for me, but make sure you explore these other options to see what's best for you and your learning style. From Lindsay Jones, though, I did really like their audio, and especially throughout the last semester, I would listen to that audio while I was driving to school or to clinical because I had a kind of long commute, and I think that made a big difference also. Or sometimes if I was having to do things around the house, I would be playing the audio and make sure that I was listening to it and actually paying attention, not just you know playing it in the background and zoning out, but actually paying attention and trying to absorb the information. Now, if you don't have access or the funds to purchase the full packages like Lindsay Jones, Kettering, and the other ones that offer audio, you can actually do the same thing I was talking about, where you take your own notes of what you don't feel comfortable with or what you don't have memorized, and then you can record yourself in different segments, you know, for each section, like do one section for ABGs, one section for PFTs, one for hemodynamics, whatever you want to do. And then listen to those while you're driving, while you're doing stuff around your house, while you're on a break, whatever. And that's another option that's a little bit cheaper too. So some of the things, that were really prominent on the test, management of mechanical ventilators. So make sure you know your normal values and make sure you know your difference between abnormal and critical values because that's something you're going to be tested on. Just because someone's pH is, you know, 7.29, are you going to intubate them? What are their other values? Is there anything else going on? Do they have Mycenae gravis or Guillain-Barre, anything of the sort that would play into that? Why would you jump straight to intubation? So make sure you're reading the question fully and make sure you know your criticals because just looking at a pH, you're probably not going to intubate someone with a pH of 7.29 unless there's something else going on. Do they have an inability to protect their airway? Were they in a house fire? And did it say marked swelling or angioedema? Anytime something says marked, that's the same thing as severe. And if it says marked or severe, you know you need to be a little bit more drastic. 
because the biggest thing that I noticed with the TMC also is you really have to pay attention to their wording. Sometimes they will say, what will you do first? Even though you probably know you're going to intubate this patient, what's the very first basic step you're going to do? If it says your patient has strider, what's the difference between if they just say they have mild strider or marked strider. What are you going to do? Are you going to start with a cool aerosol or are you going to start with racemic epi? So you need to know the differences between that wording and what the escalation levels are because most of the time they want you to start from least invasive to most invasive unless there are those keywords or those critical values, things where it says marked or severe or um, there's a extremely critical value. So you really have to pay attention to your values. And it's not just going to be um, AVG values. You need to know your values for weaning and extubation, um, intubation, and again, abnormal critical. You need to know your lab values. Um, the ones I saw more were sodium and potassium, so make sure you really know those. And I did get some x-rays. I felt like they were pretty straightforward. There wasn't anything that was trying to trick you in them. So just make sure you're comfortable with your basic x-ray interpretation and you'll be okay there. And one of the biggest things everybody asks about math. <laughs> so you're not allowed to have a calculator in your testing area and that's okay because it's going to be very basic math. Addition, subtraction, multiplication. But honestly, I think other than just, you know, standard calculations for mechanical ventilation, like your ideal body weight to figure out what your average tidal volume should be for your patient, I might have had two or three equations out of 160 questions. And you'll hear this in a lot of the exam prep material. So many people stress out about the math, and I was one of them. I was stressed about a lot of the equations as well, but they really don't focus on the equations a lot. And again, everybody's test is different, so the types of things I saw in my test might be different from yours. One of you may get more than three you know, equations. One of you may get one equation, so there's no way of really telling, but just make sure that you are, you know, familiar with some of the basic ones, like total flow for Heliox, and then dosing calculations. So, but again, if you are having trouble remembering them, you can either write them on a cue card and, you know, just kind of look at them occasionally. And you do get one piece of scratch paper when you go in. So if there's an equation you're like, oh, I feel like this is going to be on there. As soon as you get in and sit down and, you know, start to take your exam, write the equation on your piece of paper if you remember it. If you don't, that's fine. Again, don't, don't stress. There's not a lot of math on there. I did see a lot of questions about mechanical ventilation. Not too much switching modes, but, um, you know, what mode would you initiate and what tidal volume, PEEP and FiO2 would you use, things of that sort. So just basic ventilator management questions. I might have gotten two or three questions about neonates, nothing too severe and you know a lot of asthma questions. So it's just the main things we deal with. Just be familiar with your basics, your normal values, your critical values, and you'll do fine. <laughs> so if you guys have any questions in particular, definitely let me know in the comments down below. I'll do another video once I take my CSE and hopefully pass, fingers crossed. <laughs> and I will talk to you next time. All right, guys. Bye.